After years of speculation, Elon Musk has finally unveiled his long-awaited Mars transportation architecture. Speaking at the International Astronautical Congress on September 27th, he revealed SpaceX's long-term plans to construct the most powerful rocket ever seen, in order to finally propel our civilization out into the solar system. As incredible as such ambitions are, it was especially interesting to see them backed up by technical specifications. So what I want to do this time is dive in and examine just what this rocket will actually be capable of. The cornerstone of any rocket is of course the engine, in this case known as Raptor, which SpaceX has been actively developing for a number of years. Although similar in size to the Merlin 1D engines currently used on the Falcon 9, the higher chamber pressure of 300 bars, combined with its full flow nature, results in a more powerful engine with a thrust in vacuum of 3,500 kilonewtons, or about three times that of Merlin, as well as a more fuel efficient engine with a vacuum specific impulse of 382 seconds. The Raptor also represents a move to cryogenic methane and liquid oxygen propellants, which have been chosen specifically with propellant production on Mars in mind. And it's important to stress here that this isn't all just idle talk, as the first test firing of a Raptor development engine was carried out on September 25th, as you can see here. In total, 42 of these Raptor engines are to be used to propel what SpaceX are calling the Interplanetary Transport System into orbit. The ITS consists of a booster, sometimes called the BFR or Big Falcon rocket, measuring 77.5 meters high and 12 meters in diameter, and a spaceship often simply referred to as the MCT or Mars Colonial Transporter which is itself 49.5 meters tall and up to 17 meters in diameter. Now both the booster and the spaceship are made of carbon fiber composites, resulting in a rocket which is lighter and stronger than materials traditionally used for expendable vehicles, such as aluminum for instance. The booster alone contains 6,700 tons of propellant, and can produce 128 meganewtons of thrust at sea level, over 3.5 times that of the Saturn V moon rocket. Altogether then, this rocket is capable of launching up to 550 tons to orbit in its expendable configuration, which is almost 20 times that of the most powerful rocket we have today, the Delta IV Heavy. Or alternatively, it can launch 300 tons to orbit in its reusable configuration. And although we expected this rocket to be a monster, as I summarized back in August, just the sheer number of engines proposed certainly took me by surprise and result in an even more powerful rocket than I really think any of us were expecting to be unveiled. If we focus in now on the spaceship part of the system, it's quite clear that it has been designed to carry large payloads, potentially as high as 450 tons, and house 100 or more people in the habitation compartments at the top. Elon even spoke about how comfortable the trip would be designed to be, with leisure activities such as movies, lectures and a restaurant provided for the passengers on board during the trip. So let's take a look at how this combined system will be used to actually send people to Mars. The interplanetary transport system will launch from pad 39A at Cape Canaveral, Florida, where the passengers will ascend a tower and cross a bridge into the spaceship. Once the passengers and cargo are aboard, the Raptor engines on the booster ignite, accelerating the spaceship to a speed of 2.4 kilometers per second. The booster will then separate, using the remaining 7% of its fuel to boost back towards the launch site where it deploys grid fins to precisely land. In order to reach Mars in the target time of between three to five months, the spaceship needs a significant amount of propellant, nearly 2,000 tons actually, as such a fast interplanetary transfer is not the most fuel efficient maneuver. 
And bearing in mind that even the powerful booster itself can only carry 300 tonnes at a time to Earth orbit, an additional tanker spacecraft then needs to be launched using the same booster before docking with the MCT, loading the primary spacecraft with propellant, then itself flying back to the launch site. So in total, the tanker spacecraft needs to launch five times just to support each colonial transporter spaceship. The aspiration is that this refuelling process should take a couple of weeks or less. Think about that for a second. Launching the most powerful rocket in history six times in a few weeks is a colossal step up from SpaceX's average launch cadence of one launch a month, which they achieved earlier this year. That's not to say it can't be done, of course, once the system is mature, but at least for the first few missions, it's quite likely that instead the crew will have to launch separately, just given how long it will take to fuel the transit spacecraft. In any case, once fueled, the spaceship will deploy solar arrays capable of generating 200 kilowatts of power, which is roughly double that of the International Space Station. It then coasts to Mars with an average journey time of 115 days, depending of course on the specific launch window used. Upon reaching Mars, it enters the atmosphere at 8.5 kilometers per second, using aerodynamic drag and a lifting trajectory to decelerate. On the final approach, the central three engines fire and landing legs deploy, settling down gently onto the surface of Mars. After the people disembark, the spacecraft connects to a propellant plant that synthesizes liquid methane and oxygen fuel using carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere and water from subsurface ice deposits. This allows the vehicle to refuel just using local resources before launching back to Earth to carry the next batch of aspiring Martian settlers. Now I know I was completely blown away when watching this announcement, which was just so much more ambitious than anything I expected to see launch in the foreseeable future. In fact, just a few years ago I actually wrote a hard science fiction novel set in the 2080s, where my optimistic guess was a few thousand people living on Mars. But this of course pales in comparison to the million people Elon would like to see by the end of this century. Realising this vision though will require large scale and rapid reusability of a magnitude that is difficult to comprehend. Just remember that we're still waiting to see how many times a landed Falcon 9 first stage can be reused. But if you want to realise Elon's plan at the proposed economic price point, of around $10 billion leading up to the first human landings, you would have to reuse the booster itself at least 1,000 times, and each spacecraft 12 times. And it's still far from clear if this level of reuse will be achievable or not. But I for one applaud Elon for laying out his vision to the international community and seeking collaboration with other public and private entities. At this point, SpaceX are investing a few million dollars per year in the interplanetary transport system, which represents about 5% of the company's cash flow. Though Elon would like to see this rise over time to eventually reach $300 million per year before 2020. And it's impressive to see actually just how far they've come with the limited resources that they've put into this to date. Because not only were all the animations we've seen based on the actual engineering CAD designs, but SpaceX have already started building hardware. You've already seen the Raptor engine test fire, but they've actually built a full-scale carbon fibre fuel tank for the spaceship. On this timeline, they're potentially looking at sending the first one of these spacecraft to Mars in 2022. Obviously, that's assuming that everything goes according to plan, both on the technological and financial front. And that could then be followed by the first human mission setting off towards the end of 2024. Now, since Elon's announcement, there has been a great deal of media coverage surrounding his overall architecture, as you might expect. Some positive, some negative. But one theme that I've been noticing repeatedly is criticism for him not revealing precisely how the people going to Mars will actually live there. 
Ultimately, I think such articles are simply missing the point, which is that Elon is focusing on building the transport system that will enable regular flights to Mars. Using an historical example, railway companies connect destinations. A railway company doesn't actually build what you find at the end. SpaceX alone can neither fund nor be expected to have the expertise to build an entire city on Mars. But what they are doing with their bold announcement is challenging the entire world to join them in making this vision become a reality. This will involve a grand coalition of governments, private companies, and perhaps wealthy philanthropists. And I certainly think there is a role for entities such as Mars One, who have been funding life support studies and surface exploration suit designs. Ultimately, the plan is to enable anyone who wants to go to Mars and can afford the roughly $100,000 ticket price in the long term to move to join the fledgling Martian settlement. And as a scientist, I personally would go in a heartbeat as there is no shortage of fascinating research possibilities over there just waiting to be found. And this system doesn't even just limit us to Mars, as it one day may let us venture to the moons of Jupiter and to Saturn, opening up the entire solar system to human exploration. But whilst there's surely a long way to go before we reach that point, I think people will truly be surprised by just how close we now are to finally witnessing ourselves become a multi-planetary species. Thanks for watching. If you're new to this channel, I produce monthly updates examining our progress towards establishing the first human settlement on Mars, along with exploratory videos on planetary science and human spaceflight. This month's feature video is a wonderful little animation focusing on the kind of society we might build on Mars. Next time, I'll be taking a detailed look at the very latest research on Proxima b and explaining how we may be able to characterise its atmosphere. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it, and please send in any questions or comments you have down below.